Uh, hello, everyone who's watching Black Mental Health Matters. Uh, welcome to yet another edition of uh, Black Mental Health Matters. So this is a special edition where we are celebrating the Black History Month. Uh, welcome to us, uh, African American History Month. Uh, we are trying to to honor uh, the Black psychologists who have contributed so so adversely to the mental health fraternity uh, globally. Um, so uh, today we are having a number of guests who are going to be talking uh, to us about uh, the contributions that uh, these people have uh, brought on board uh, as far as mental health is concerned. Uh, my name is Claire Nasasura, right here in Uganda, and I'll be hosting this show with my co-host, my, my co uh, sister. She's, she's uh, in Germany. She'll be introducing herself, and then uh, we shall introduce our guests, and then we dive into the topic. So, sister, can you introduce yourself and then we can get into the topic? Sister, can you unmute and introduce yourself? Okay, can you hear me? Okay, thank you very much. I'm Sister Oloron Toyan psychosocial counselor okay can you hear me from hamburg yeah. okay thank you very much and um, um i think it's very important that we celebrate okay, um black history hamburg. month by remembering yeah, those who have now. made immense okay, contributions and especially in this area okay, of mental um, health Okay, uh, thank you very much, sister, for that brief introduction of yourself. Um, so I want to allow my guests to introduce themselves uh, one by one so that uh, we don't spend so much time on introductions and then we can get into the topic itself. As we, I know our viewers are impatiently waiting for us to get into it so that they can hear what these brilliant people have, have to say about uh, the black psychologists. So I will start with you, um, the only man in the house, trying to introduce yourself and then... Uh, the will follow. This time it's men first, not like it's first. So uh, my name is Jean-Luc Cadet. Uh, I'm a physician. I work for the National Institute on Drug Abuse in uh, Maryland. I'm originally from Haiti, and I now live in Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you very much for that brief introduction. Um, we are going now. Uh, next, we have uh, Ayesha. Is that how you pronounce your name? Yes, um, Ayesha. Yeah. So I am a solution focused hypnotherapist and expert coach. Okay, you pronounce your name? Um, uh, yeah. One minute, please. Ayesha. So I am a solution focused hypnotherapist and expert coach. Okay, you pronounce your name? Um, so one I think we're having some sound issues there. The yeah, yeah. Screen. But now I think we are clear. We are clear. We are set to go. So uh, you can go ahead with the introduction, please. Please go ahead. Aisha, go ahead and introduce yourself. So we can okay. Can you hear me? Because there's a lot of feedback. Yes. Okay, so my name is Aisha Giselle Donnelly. I'm a solution focused hypnotherapist and expert life coach. I, I work in private practice and I'm based in the UK, London, UK. I'm here to discuss the above topic. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And I'm glad to have you on set. I'm actually I'm really excited to have you on set today. Uh, so we have uh, Dr. Love. Can you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Dr. Lova Shebu, a GP trained in Nigeria, but currently reside in the UK. Apart from being a medical doctor, I'm also an experienced speaker and writer, and I'm also a coach for teens. Thank you. So I'm actually here to, to discuss the contribution of our Black ancestors towards psychology. Uh, okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, but I am from Nigeria. Uh, recently, actually, I think uh, two days ago, I've had Nigerian artists in Uganda, and um, maybe I would like to sing, and I'm from Nigeria, and I show you my music anytime from now. No problem. 
Yeah, so it's just wait for me. Uh, so uh, we are going to, today our topic is about uh, honoring uh, black psychologists who have uh, contributed so greatly to to the mental health fraternity globally. Uh, so uh, if I should uh, take you through, uh, we are going to, to look at uh, a few people that we are going to be recognizing today and maybe we shall have others along the way. Uh, we have a few names here. Um, uh, we have uh, Mami Phillips Clark, there is Kenneth uh, Van Kroos Clark, there is John P. Comer, there is uh, Paul Conley, there is uh, Ms. M. Justin Elders, there is Solomon Carter. I don't know if people know those, those people. They are uh, some of the psychologists that contributed to, to, to the mental health fraternity in the past. So I'm trying to read out their names so we can understand each other and see where we can start from. And then there is, um, I'm reading them uh, randomly, I have a list, but I'm reading them randomly. Uh, there is Robert Williams, there is Francis Cecil, there is Joseph White. Um, and here in Uganda, by the way, there is someone else appreciate her here in Uganda. She was the first Ugandan psychiatric nurse. She's called uh, Rashanda Selina. I congratulate her. For the wonderful work she, she did to ensure that uh, the mental health fraternity that's not there to write in Uganda, despite her having her education in the UK, she still came back right here and uh, did something. So, uh, if, I might, if I may, I may start with the only man in the house. Um, how, how important has been the works of, the, of our forefathers in the psychiatry world or in the psychology world? So uh, I, I guess you want me to answer the question. Uh, so uh, I'm a trained psychiatrist. So I went to medical school at Columbia University and did my psychiatry residency there. But I should tell you uh, as a preface that uh, I really didn't learn about the contribution of black psychologists and psychiatrists until I actually started to read more about uh, the racial inequities in psychiatry and psychology and in mental health in general. So the first one that I really uh, became aware of was uh, Albert Kumar, who's contributed quite a lot in terms of uh, discussion of diagnosis, misdiagnosis uh, of black patients by um, white uh, psychiatrists and psychologists. It is very interesting that recently, both the American Psychiatric Association and the American Psychological Association have put out, uh, uh, I guess, letters, uh, briefs, uh, apologies about the negative impact of uh, American psychiatry and psychology on black lives. So the several of the early psychiatrists, for example, wrote a lot about um, mistreatment. Uh, so you know that some of the psychiatrists, American psychiatrists came up with diagnoses like drapetomania uh, which is running sleep disorders. And later on, uh, uh, black psychiatrists fought against that. And um, then in terms of misdiagnosis of uh, affective disorder, manic depressive disorders as against schizophrenia. Uh, so there's mentioned people like Bill Lawson, who's still pretty much alive, pretty active, is written about misdiagnosis of schizophrenia and um, affective disorders. Because when you misdiagnose people, uh, and then, then there's a way you treat them, right? You treat them with this medication or that psychotherapeutic approach. But if, if they're misdiagnosed, they end up in state hospitals and nobody uh, seems to take care of them because while they're schizophrenic, they cannot do any better. But if you, somebody is diagnosed as manic depressive illness, they might get lithium, they get to 
be uh, uh, treated properly and they discharge out on. So a lot of the early black psychiatrists and psychologists spent a lot of time trying to undo white, uh, white uh, psychiatry and psychology uh, had done to, to, to black people, not just black Americans, but uh, black immigrants mm -hmm. in the United States. So I think those are very important issue when we start talking about black mental health. Um, with that, these early pioneers who pointed out the abuses of psychiatry and psychology, uh, I'm, I'm not sure where we would be today. So I think it is really important that uh, you're having a program. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Dr. Lau, do you have any particular psychologist whom you know has contributed the most to what is the mental health problem, maybe in Nigeria or in Uganda, right here, or in Ghana, or anyone, anywhere, any black psychologist? Okay, to be honest, I like him. Um, like that, Yelia said, um, in medical school, we even, even during my psychiatric posting, my 500 level, there was nothing like black psychologists. You know, most researches is all based on white. And I was, then it was, it was like normal. But mm -hmm. I, as I began to do my residency, I, I discovered that most, even most of the studies, we, we base them on what the white says. Then, as time goes on, I, I, there should be black people that should actually see things from our perspective. So unfortunately, I didn't really see it in Nigeria. Okay, the Ugandan person you're talking about, I just had a few today. Then until I now browse, so I now saw all these pioneer black uh, psychologists that actually paved the way for us. And the person that really caught my attention was uh, Robert, we, Robert Lee Williams, whom you just mentioned. And why his own stood out for me was because of the case of the standard testing that when he was in high school, he took the test and it was said that uh, he would be, that his job for life would be that of manual labor. I believe we read about the history and he went against the norm. He got a bachelor's, a master's and a PhD in psychology. And he was able to say, no, this test, this crap it out because it's not favoring the black. Like then he now, as we all know, the, he now manufactured or developed the black uh, intelligence test of cultural homogeneity where white blacks were able to do better than whites if actually the test is based on black experience and speech. So his stood out for me because it has to do with intelligence. It has to do with, okay, see, this is my voice as a black person. I, I can do, I can do this. It's, I, I do not have to live with the standard of a white person. And it, to me, it is, it is a huge comfort that personally he spoke to me because he was so outstanding in the, in the case of intellect, intellectualism that, okay, I'm a black person. I don't need to be graded because I'm white under the white basis or standard. Mm -hmm. So fortunately, I have not really seen in Nigeria, but the work of Robert Lee, Lee Williams spoke personally to me. And honestly, the accolades, the honor that is, that is being given to him is worth, worth it. Because I think because of inferiority complex associated with Blacks, then I wonder how they would have felt knowing, giving them a death sentence based on a white, a right in grand results. You know, you're going to be a liberal, you're going to be a farmer, just mm -hmm. like that. But when, I believe when Robert brought out this testing, it, it actually, it was like a breath of fresh air. You can mm -hmm. see people okay, I'm going beyond this. I am more than this, actually in the black folk. So he's personally, I, I actually love his work because personally I gravitated towards that. So unfortunately I've not seen any Nigerian prominent in quotes, though we have Nigerian psychologists. I've not seen any prominent Nigerian quotes that actually had made such contribution. So actually I'm going to tilt towards Robert Lee Williams too. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, thank you so much. And just talking about Nigerians, I think it's a good point to bring up the work of um, 
Thomas Adeoye Lambo, who was a psychiatrist in Nigeria. Um, Dr. Thomas uh, Lambo was born in, um, is an indigenous Yoruba man who was born in Abelkuta. And he had um, studied psychiatry, psychiatry and of course facing this problem which you talked about, that is we learn in white institutions about white people actually. And um, after studying in, in the UK and returning to Nigeria, he set up, uh, he, he set up a, a mental institution, the Arrow Mental Hospital, also in Abeokuta. And he realized he was having problems with the indigenous people who were very suspicious of this um, institutionalized um, health facility. So what he did is he started to um, bring in traditional healers as well and also incorporated. So while the patients were in the facility, also being treated by um, traditional um, healers and herbalists, he also spoke to farmers in the area. So the patients would be here in the facility getting treatment. At the same time, they were still working and productive in the community, and they would go out and work with the farmers. So out of this type of um, 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 research, he developed his own um, procedure. And this is um, so very powerful in that in this area, it, it reduced the stigma and people were actually getting healed as this is one of the problems sometimes in the psychiatric institutions that people are treated and treated and treated but never really experiencing healing. So I just bring up his name. He was also um, one of the uh, deputy uh, directors of the World Health Organization. So just to see and honor how sometimes we have uh, our professional specialist advocates and their histories are often hidden that we don't even know them because it's not even considered or taught in the, in the um, medicine schools. Yeah. So uh, if I understood you completely, uh, the, the question was about whether we, what kind of standards that uh, we are actually using, um, because I was having a little problem hearing um, you. Uh, from my perspective, I think what both uh, Sister Olo and uh, uh, and also Dr. Love touched on the idea of standards uh, is a very, very important issue, right? For example, in terms of the intelligent quotient test, right? So th those have been used very, uh, in a very negative way in the United States also, right? So if you, you've heard about the bell curve and this top of the neuropsychological test, the psychological test, that when black patients come into psychiatric hospitals, all of these are normalized on white population. And then they are used to then put black folks in or people of African descent on at the bottom, basically, of the wells uh, in psychiatric uh, hospitals. So I think we need to develop our own standards, like Dr. Love mentioned, 
and uh, and Dr. Uh, Sister Olo may, uh, also mentioned in terms of looking at indigenous ways of dealing with uh, psychiatric illnesses. Um, for example, in the United States, we have this racial inequities in terms of depression, anxiety, uh, and then a lot of these inequities are secondary to the fact that people of African descent are working in majority white places where they have to face the stress of racism on a daily basis. So this is a, an important issue that we really need to, to deal with. How Even in places like Nigeria, right, like in Africa, the standards, you know, it was mentioned before, we go get trained in Europe and then in white institution, and then we go to Africa and then have to work and then try to impose white standards on African people of African descent. I, I had to face the same thing. I train in a totally white institution. I mean, I don't practice anymore, but when when I was seeing black patients, in my mind, it was really the, I was applying white standards that I learned under the supervision of white psychiatrists. So this is a big trouble because we need to then uh, basically de brainwash ourselves, decolonize ourselves so that we can provide better care for our community. Some of the ancestors learn about this, but because they, they were what they were doing were never taught in the schools and the programs that we attended, we had to find out about them later on on ourselves. That's what happened to me. Sam, that's what happened to Dr. Love. Uh, you have to learn this uh, yourselves so that you say, no, the standards don't apply to my to my patients or the people I want to take care of. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Love, do you agree with what um, the only gentleman in the house has said? Yes, I do. But uh, to add to it, you may ask the question, um, why is it that, what actually is the problem that we are lagging behind, right? Right, Claire? Okay. I think um, the, the issue, like like Sarah actually pointed out, was we trying to impose the white standard on the black community. And secondly, secondly, this is actually what I have experienced, is not actually trying to understand the black origin, where they come from, their preferences, the way they think of that. Like uh, Mom, Mom Solu said, uh, when Dr. Lambo came, he was actually having issues because he wanted to do, he wanted to impose it. Then, God willing, he now had to think back. What do I have to do? So it's, it's just in summary of what, this could be a major thing of what is making us to lag back to, in order to push this, this pair forward. You understand? Trying to, but actually, it's, it's, it's actually taxing because one, we are adults, one. This is what we, we've been fed. Like, like I said, this is what we, we've drunk, we've eaten it, we've seen it, it's in us, it's ingrained in us. And now coming down to our roots, how do we start on learning? How do we start learning in order to actually, you know, blend with our own roots, with our own origin, with our own people? So I think it has to be if we as Blacks can actually marshal out our own parts. I think it will go a long way in helping us forward our course in psychology. It's actually, I um, actually love um, this Howard College because it's a historical black college and university in abroad. But I, I think actually what, what they actually teach the people is when I browse them, what I got from them, that was some years back, was uh, it was all about, see, blacks, okay, this is the way we do our own thing. And I believe this will actually they have their own psyche. Yes, they're in the white population, but they know who they are. Sort of their identity is not being taken, no matter what is being rubbing on them. Do you understand me? So I think if we could actually 
this create our own paths in all in this area. It will help. It won't. It won't be so difficult for us to actually forward our goal. That's what I would say. Thank you very much. Asifa, do you have something to add on what you have said? Yes, thank you so much. I think um, um, when we think again, we have to talk about um, black psychology. Um, there is this um, uh, special now discipline or development that there is now a black psychology here yeah, where, where, where um, attempts have been made to really understand the experience of people of African descent. And um, yeah, we can honor uh, our theorists such as Joseph Baldwin, um, Amos Wilson, Naim Akbar, Daudi Azibo, Sean Utsi, or Wade Nuro, you know, Linda James Meyer, Cheryl Grills. These are all people who have defined what we now know as black psychology. Um, psychology through the lens of uh, African philosophy yes. and the black man. Yes, and this is this is so so important. Um, there is now the association of black psychology exists, and um, it would be great that we also see that we have to really develop our own institutions for, uh, for by us for us and. Uh, yeah, this is very important. This, I think, is one is a is a very important point that has been made. Actually, I would also like to add somebody that uh, um, people don't often talk about, Fwens Fanon. Um, Fwens Fanon, yes. Yeah, I, think, I thought you were going to list that in your in your list because I can tell you as a young person. Yes, reading uh, Friends Fanon as a, I guess I was about 18, 19, 20, when I kept on reading it and right reading that those, uh, his essays yes. basically saved my psychological health, right? Right. Because, you know, the idea that we are living in white spaces, uh, in uh, walking around with black skin, but have a white, white mentality. mentality yeah. okay? So I think it's very important. And then this is not just true of me or maybe of you. Maybe you guys were saved uh, earlier than I was. But it is important for us to recognize that whether people are in Nigeria, Ghana, Kenya, the United States or Germany or England, we all have this been colonized to think of ourselves in a way yes. as less done because yes. we been, they have applied this uh, uh, white uh, standards on us and we go along with it. We do, yes. And, and then so we need to fight against this. We need to set up uh, and, uh, and treat our people uh, separately based on our own indigenous upbringing. In, there's some Haitians uh, who are talking in terms of the inclusion of things like voodoo and mm -hmm. other religious precepts in combination with psychology in order to provide better care for, for Haitians and other people of uh, um, uh, African descent. With that yeah. this melding of our backgrounds, our history, not the history that we were taught by uh, European colonizers, but the history that was developed by our own uh, people, uh, people like Diop and others. Um, our story. Who, who looked and really traced our history before the invasion of Africa by European mm -hmm. colonists who abused mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. our people. So we cannot depend on the psychology of abusers in order to free ourselves. So we need to develop our own psychology, continue to develop our own psychology by looking at others who can be for us uh, to, do, to do the better work uh, going in the future. Yes. Thank you so yeah, much. So, to set an example, um, if, if just like uh, what Sa said, 
if you look at the Asians, one thing I love about them is that they never forget their roots. They can go, they can come to the, they can come to the UK, they can go to the US, they can go anywhere and learn. But if you see a nation, you see a nation. You know that the person is a nation. There is nothing, there is no brain. In fact, I don't know if they've been brainwashed from, from the womb that they can never forget their And that is one striking thing I love about them. Unlike we, you understand, we, some of us, we just live on that handout. I believe these are pioneers that actually went the extra mile because they think, no, this thing is, is, is enough, is enough. So if we can actually have that mentality, okay, fine, I'm going to learn this from you. I'm going to learn this craft, this expertise from you, but I am who I am. It's not going to change me. I think that will actually go a long way to in helping the back. Thank you very much for that. Uh, wow, this one of, okay, in the, in the, just over a discussion, you people, you are all focusing on us being African to do our own thing to ensure that we incorporate more of what we believe in than what the whites have brought us, which is some, which is something good. Now, I think what I've noticed is uh, particularly right in Uganda because. Uh, there are a lot of incentives. Uh, these medics go to school and they return to work in government facilities. They actually pay peanuts. And when they pay peanuts, they prefer playing abroad, to work in the USA, in Canada, in South Africa, and wherever they go to, to do uh, this work, this kind of work from there. Uh, South Africa is, is, uh, is actually African. But sometimes they go beyond what I've said. Uh, they go beyond just to go and work for the white folks they know. They want to be paid in dollars, in pounds, and want to be earning much more, much more than they earn here. Yeah. So, uh, in this in this regard, if we are going to look at doing our, our own thing, uh, so that we empower ourselves to look at work ahead of our own thing, what do you think should be done to ensure all this is achieved? Because apparently, if there is no money, I mean, there is nothing to be done. Everything will rotate around money. There is no money, there are no incentives, there, are, there is no money to buy the equipment, there is no money to you know, set up these schools. We are not going to achieve anything. So, uh, us as a, as a mental health advocate, we are trying to, you know, to, to ensure this happens. What, which one should be our first step? What, what, what should we start from? I start with you, the only man in the house. <laughs> So, uh, so if so, you you're focusing uh, on the financial incentive. It sounds like uh, I think it it is it's an issue. I mean, I think this issue is true wherever we go. I've written about this, for example, for for the United States. Uh, Haitians in the United States, people of African descent in the United States, uh, in Haiti. So, what's the incentive? Um, so what happened, because there are no financial incentive in the countries of origins, people leave, right? So they leave and they don't want to go back, right? People get trained. They're living in the United States, Canada, Europe, or England. They're doing well financially. So there's no real incentive to go back. So that those are the issues that we when we start talking about decolonization of our minds we have to start thinking is it only financial incentive that we are depending on in order to do better for our people right and the other thing related to that i think is the idea that there's not enough money in our countries of origin I think actually that's not true. I think there are enough resources that if we all wanted to coalesce together, put our heads together and say, okay, we're going to do this for Ghana. We're going to do this for Nigeria. We're going to do this for South Africa. Or we're going to do this for community, black communities in the United States or Haitian communities in the United States or in Haiti we could do better. So it's the question is, is there a will among people of African descent to do better for ourselves instead of falling into the trap of European 
communities that giving us carrots that we, oh, wow, there are a lot of carrots around here. I really don't need to worry about the people behind me. I think that's where the problem actually lies. Are we willing, do we have the will to go and say, okay, we are African, we're going to be programmed by ourselves and for ourselves, like sister said. So that's where the problem is. And the idea is, how do you get to that point where you develop that will? I think the only way to do this is by de-Europeanize right, our minds. So we need to reject European standards and accept our, our Africanness and, and say, okay, that's what we're going to do from now on. We're not going to live by uh, as professionals. And, and then since we are the leaders in the communities, if we start doing this, other people I think will follow and then we'll be able to, uh, as a group, uh, are united and do better for the mental health of our mm -hmm. communities, no matter where they are. I think we're losing the sound. I can hear you, but I don't. I think the the hosts. Yeah. Then I, then I jump in right there. Thank you so much for what you said. It's really so true, which is why I think we have to start um, bringing in such philosophies as Ubuntu into what we do. And um, you, you, what you said is right. Very right. We come from richness, actually, richness and greatness. And uh, we find ourselves battling, wrestling, and struggling in violent societies that don't really accept us. And um, in the spirit of Ubuntu, when we start to think that I am, because you are, because we are, and notice the interconnectedness of our black being, our black communities, then we can start to really generate these solutions uh, together. But as long as we are looking for solutions in uh, white institutions or white societies, um, I think we just perpetuate the violence. And some of these things which you were saying, um, Sister Love, like describing how um, um, we do not recognize our own values as compared to, to the Asian uh, community, this has to do with the uh, perpetual systemic trauma which we are still undergoing. It never really stopped. We are, we are not in a post-colonial uh, state. The colonialism still continues till today. The slavery still continues till today. And this is some of the things why it's so important that we are organizing together like this, Black Mental Health Matters, an African global network. And this is, I think, um, what we have to continue to do, seeing that the problems which are affecting us are global. It's not just in a small village. It's not just in Hamburg. We are talking of problems and it seems like we're living in the same village. Although someone is in Nigeria, someone is in Uganda, someone is in the States, someone is in uh, uh, Grenada, but we are repeating the same thing. We're talking of um, uh, um, violent systems of white supremacy, which is still in place, has always been in place. Children have been born and raised, socialized, educated in this system. You know, so yes, I think it's um, really wonderful what you said towards us recognizing our, our, our common uh, heritage and um, collaborating together and um, yeah, finding alternative ways of living in a society that advances us as a people. Okay. So actually, yes. uh, hold on, Sister Stella. I wanted to mm -hmm. add something to what Sister Ola was saying. 
Okay. Uh, you said educated us. I would would say miseducated <laughs> because uh, we're so miseducated that mm -hmm. we're fighting with each other, not recognizing that we are all descended of great African, yeah. African doctors, African farmers who were brought to different places and treat and enslaved. But we need we need to on now re-educate re -educate ourselves so that we can do better for all of our communities of Africans, no matter where we are. I think that's the important thing. No matter where we are, no we matter need to where we accept are. our Africanness and start collaborating and helping. Mm -hmm. us. Yes, to add to that, um, one, one of the reasons I actually see it as an excuse, though, is that means it could be valid to some people, is um, people always blaming the African government, okay? They, they contribute to a very large extent, okay? Like Mommy Toy said, if we stay and continue making excuses, we aren't going anywhere. Understand? We actually need to bring out several reasons, several suggestions, several ways, several methods for us to say no. Let's be better than this. Rather, like a Claire was saying in sense, Claire, it is true, but like, 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 but like Sa said, it's not totally true. Africans have money, African nations have money. Look at the politicians if you think that I'm lying. If we don't have money, our politicians ought not to have money. You see, all these things have been diverted to so, to so many things to personal funds, to family funds. So People are thinking that this is the best way, the best way for us to survive is to leave this nation. So I actually see it is, is another subtle method. Like Stathony said, this colonialism is ongoing. It's another subtle method. You see Africans always, African government borrowing loan and loan and loan. It has, it's a vicious circle. It affects the masses. So we see, as the best way to go out is to let's move to another country. Now, let me sorry to drag us, but that also happened to me. I mean, the health system and in the health sector in Nigeria is mm -hmm. is is monitoring. If monitoring is going to be honest, monitoring will tell you what's happening there. Is nothing to write home about. Mm -hmm. More than half of my classmates are outside the country, mm -hmm. and they are doing well in quotes. Mm -hmm. You know why I said in quotes because I am here now. The awareness is not that wonderful. So you see, this colonialism is 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 subtle. It makes you see, it makes you say the grass is greener on the other side. It's not totally true. But in your own side, you have factors suffocating you. Mm -hmm. So it is what we how I wish that the audience we are like a thousand or something. Is what we actually start bringing out ways. How can we make these things better at home? Home is home, north, south, east, west, home is home. And if, if we don't come together to say, no, African government, this is what we want, or this in our own little corner, set up organization in our own, in our home countries, this is what, what we want it to happen. This is the way we're going to govern and steadily and gradually work towards it. I don't really think we can get it from it. That's my suggestion. and um, you know, uh, for whoever is watching, we have to 
Excuse me. I can't hear you. We can't hear you, Claire. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Your voice is very faint and is echoing. I don't know what's happening. Maybe something different. Can you hear me right now? Yeah, little, little bit. Yeah. yeah. Speak maybe slowly. Maybe if you speak slowly, it's better. There's a connect. There's a network problem. No, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. It's off. Can you put the microphone close to your mouth, maybe, and then speak a little bit slower? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Speak slowly. So uh, my point was about uh, the budget allocation to the mental health fraternity. Uh, like I said, uh, whenever the writer in Uganda, I'll give you an example because uh, I'm more, I know, I know more about Uganda than uh, any other country in the world because I'm Ugandan. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm looking at a point where a uh, minister of health is always allocated uh, maybe like 10% of the entire budget that's always read out. And uh, the mental health fraternity is always given uh, 1% of that entire budget to cater for the mental health issues all over the country. And uh, these things, not on, this issue is not only happening in Uganda, but in Kenya, in Tanzania, and it's even maybe worse in DR Congo, worse in uh, Sudan, or maybe the other countries. Yes, there are network problems, which is one of the disadvantages of this uh, <laughs> online network. But still, we it's it's the possibility to bring us together. So uh, maybe I take the time now to just read something a little about uh, Franz Fanon, who you brought up. I'd like to hear that. That would be great. Yes, okay. <laughs> so, Franz Fanon was born in Martinique, educated in France, and after psychiatric training, administered a psychiatric hospital in Algeria. He made numerous contributions to psychiatry, which are described in the, which, are, which, are, which maybe are remembered in his books, four books. So, as recommendations for today, one would be black skin, white masks, then we have towards the African Revolution, a dying colonialism, and of course, maybe most people know it as well, the wretched of the earth. Fanon became a spokesman for the third world citizens of all nations by describing in sensitive, clinically astute terms, the psychology of racism and its untoward effects upon oppressor and oppressed. He also described the dehumanization and psychological treatment inherent in colonialist exploitation. With Dr. Fanon's premature death at the age of 37 in 1961, 
the world was deprived of one of the most eloquent and skilled spokesmen for those who are oppressed by the pro-white, anti-black paranoia, which is racism. Yes, that, I mean, that, so it was very, very disturbing to me mm. as a 20 uh, something reading Fanon's lectures and then to realize that um, as a black worldwide community, we yeah. lost this brilliant uh, psycho psychiatrist, psychologist, this thinker oh, yeah. that really helped me. Think about what he could have done if uh, he hadn't uh, gone so early. Right, uh, right. So I think what we can do as a group and, uh, and we're here together talking about these issues is to actually push for other uh, individuals like black psych psychologists, black psychiatrists, social workers uh, to really try to work better together in terms mm -hmm. of uh, trying to counteract the negative impact of white, uh, white psychiatry and psychology yeah. as had on our people. Somebody in the audience mentioned the thing about the misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. Misdiagnosis, in, whether it's in Africa, in Europe, in Africa, uh, one of the biggest problems that uh, patients face. Mm -hmm. And that's not related to finances because whether you are upper class, middle class, lower class, black person, mm -hmm. your chances of getting misdiagnosed by a black, uh, by a white uh, psychiatrist or psychologist is about the same. So mm -hmm. I think it's very, very important that we recognize and not think it's a class issue. There are people mm -hmm. in our communities who like to talk about, oh, this is a class issue. Most of what we face is as, uh, in terms of mental health is not related no. to class. I mean, think about Naomi Osaka. I mean, she's a multimillionaire. And when she started to talk about her mental health, she was attacked mostly by a bunch of white individuals who right. didn't want her to take care of her own mental health. So I think while we're discussing this, I think it's really important to pay attention to the fact more and more black folks, okay, even those who are not trained like us are realizing that the standards that they've been living by are uh, European-centric, right? Right. We need to go revert to Afrocentric exactly. um, uh, standards so that we can have better mental health care. It's right. very traumatizing yeah. to be, live in communities where you feel where the propaganda of white superiority, black inferiority, is mm -hmm. what is driving the system. It's yes. Yeah, Thank what you. I want to add to that is this uh, I'm actually going to say from a from personal experience, mental mm -hmm. issues is really, really underreported in the blacks. Hmm. Starting from home, starting from Nigeria, my country. Mm -hmm. And then it's being perceived as if you are most people buckle it up. You are not meant to be sick. You are not meant to be sick mentally. You understand? You know, the blackness, I don't know if I am overshooting. I may be wrong in this, in this next statement I'm going to make. Blackness is actually it's a, a synonymous with, with strength, with mm -hmm. strongness, in quotes. You, you can endure this. You understand? Mm -hmm. like our black mothers, it, no matter what they're passing through, they still do the choice they ought to do. The strong black narrative. You understand what? Even if they die, they, they, they will have to get this thing done. So it, it's been it's been looked upon as if it's, it's an abnormal thing. What well, was mental health of the black people? You're talking about mm -hmm. Nigerian experience, all right? No, we don't. We are all strong. That's why I don't know <laughs> if I'm actually going to talk about postpartum postpartum depression, which I passed through. It will like ah, the first time it happened to me, my host was like, ah, does it happen to us? What? What is postpartum depression? Mm -hmm. Is as bad as that. It's, 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 it's been looked at as an alien thing. 
So like like Sarah said, if we could, there is nothing to be ashamed in mental health matters, honestly. If we as Africans can just give all this strong, strong man showmanship and say, there's nothing wrong in admitting our vulnerability. That this is one of the things that can make us, you know, repel these Europeanized ideologies. Mm -hmm. Admitting our vulnerability. Yes, I am. I am sick. You mm -hmm. know, I have anxiety. I think it was last two, three years when suicide rate was so much in Nigeria. They were like, "I was happening." It has been there. People are covering it up. People are using rapper in my own native language to cover it up because we are meant to be strong. Mm -hmm. That is what the black man is in African country. Mm -hmm. So most of these things are under the You understand? It, it is, it is, it, they see it as, as a daily thing. You come out from it, it's no problem. But it shouldn't be so. It shouldn't be so. So if we can actually go back home, we educate our people, decolonize their brain. Okay, there's nothing wrong with this. Come on, let's be free. I think it will go a long way to help us. Mm -hmm. so Thank you. Sorry, sister. So we, when, we talk, when we're talking about being strong, I think we also should probably touch on stigma, the stigma yes. associated yes. with being having some mental health issues mm -hmm. and the fear of seeking help from a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think those are issues that that very probably a prominent role in preventing us from uh, seeking help and helping mm -hmm. ourselves and um, being better and basically surviving racism in this stress disorder. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, um, I wonder if, um, you know of Kenneth and Mommy Clark? No, ma'am. Okay, so these are a married couple. Um, psychologists. Okay, yes, uh, Kenneth and Mommy Clark. Yeah, I read about them. The first exactly, they yes, work yes. as a married team and conducted a lot of research about yes. um, among children, you know, in, um, during the civil rights movement. I read about him. Yes. Also one of our ancestors who we remember as we talk about uh, psychology and um, historical contributions. You know, they in the 1940s, they performed a lot of experiments using dolls to study children's attitude about race. So I remember how how really moved and heartbreaking I was to see this doll experiment. It's being used often today too. Yeah. To see the impact of racism and with it you can show that um, children as young as three, three. are impacted by racism. And um, their work was pioneering in this area. Even um, the this lady Jennifer Eberhardt, yes. the one that yeah, I think her work is highly uh, recommendable too. I really really commend her for her work for her to be able to bring her this sub to or consciousness of people judging blacks associated them with crime. I think mm. this is a good one too. Hmm. Very very important. Yeah, um, who, what, who are, what other um, historians, we can't name them all, yeah. but um, who has impacted you in the, in the work? Who are we trying to emulate? Um, what energies are we trying to um, recall in the work that we're doing regarding mental health? Those who we honor, those who have dedicated their lives to improving the mental health of black people, and we thank them for their contributions. And um, today we are remembering them and uh, talking about their work. Yeah, I'm. 
the one of the people that actually I personally gravitated to was um Beverly Daniel Tatum. She's mm -hmm. still alive. And the one that made um, um about uh, racial identity mm -hmm. and how race affects children. Mm -hmm. so, I he there's something she talked about, she, she was like uh, talking about race is talking really important. Race. Discussing about it is important in eliminating racism, and that is that is very very important. There's nothing, you know, some people, some people that are not black, they normally they normally you know gloss over it, they normally you know cover it up. There's nothing wrong with talking about it if actually everybody's open-minded towards it. It it helps, it helps in identifying and and eliminating racism because you may be racist and you don't know the other person may be racist and you don't know and you as a black man may be prejudiced against the other person and you may not know it's also a form of racism so yeah. it is good we discuss about race there's nothing wrong there it helps in identity and she was like incorporating it in education is very very good kind of among teenagers let, let them embrace who they are let them embrace their racial identity is very very important. i think that she, she that's her work is also commendable. Thank you for that contribution. Are there other names that we should recall tonight? There are actually many of them, but I actually once. <laughs> Comment all for all for all that they did. How is this Black History Month is done in African countries? Honestly, it's only <laughs> done in, in, in the USA. In Africa, what we don't because we are all black. So what do we know about Black History Month? <laughs> so when I came, I said, having a headache about Black History Month, Africa is Africa. Like assuming, I strongly believe, as, assuming it was done back home. These psychologists, uh, I would have heard about them. Because yes, yes. <laughs> this um, then when I was uh, still at home, um, these pharmaceutical companies go from hospital to hospital, you know, telling us about their drugs. So there's something that they always do. They always give us studies based on what white people have done. You know, this person at Dell did this research in Scotland. Yeah. That this this antibiotic work. So one day our one of our consultants, he was very and so like, is it like no black man has done? Any research on this anti <laughs> yes. So I, it, it struck me. It, it, it's not really a. It's not a fighting thing. That's what people don't understand. It's about you being you and embracing you. And there's nothing wrong with that. You mustn't always copy and copy and copy. What about you? What about your originality? So I believe that if this thing can actually be done in African universities, even if they don't want to make it, if can be, if can if this Africa. Black History Month can be brought down to our university. Let's start from there. So our secondary schools, let's start from there. I think it, it, the way we are totally dependent on the other people, it, it will not, it will on the West, it will not be like that. We will be proud of ourselves. We be proud that we have partners that have achieved something for us beyond Nelson Mandela that we've been hearing his name. Mm -hmm. Also in other areas of expertise. That's what I want to say. I think actually this touches on something that Franz Fano um, talked about, is the fact that as Africans, uh, descendants of Africans in the diaspora, we have a tendency to look towards Europe, right? Yeah. We, we look towards Europe or, and reject the motherland. Yeah. I think what we need to do as a uh, black psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, is actually look toward the motherland and reject your, reject uh, so that uh, we can uh, be free of the, all of the tentacles that are squeezing our mind and our psyche. With that, the rejection of Europe and the embracing of Africa, I think it's going. We're going to continue to suffer from stress and depression and psychosis and anxiety, and um, and it's not a question of financial resources. 
It's a psychological mindset. mindset. Mindset, yeah. We need to undo it. And as as professionals, we need to work with our folks trying to undo right. that, decolonize our own minds, and then hopefully help other people to decolonize. And mm-hmm. but at the same time, though, we need to work hard so that if we're working in institutions say in Germany, England, or the United yeah. States, where the hierarchy is controlled by white yes. psychiatrists or psychologists who are misdiagnosing our people. We need to exactly. stand up for our people. Our ancestors did that. So it is as if we forgot that ancestors were brave people, brave men and women mm-hmm. who stood up and said, this is wrong. We need to do that too. We need to say this is wrong. Uh, this is this uh, this my misdiagnosis. You cannot use this medication with uh, this person because you misdiagnose this person. We need to say that racism does have an impact on people's psychological mm-hmm. health, and don't. And then whatever it is, we may have to accept some punishment from the European colonialist if we do. Right. But we have to be brave and repeat what our ancestors did. Powerful statement. Yes. Very powerful. powerful. Okay, Claire. Claire? Uh, Thank you. Welcome. So, so sorry about that. Uh, there are some technical issues that happened here. Can you hear me right now? Yes. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you answered my question when I was away. We did. <laughs> okay, uh, that, we that's, did. Wonderful. Uh, that's wonderful. So uh, as regards to Black History Month, because uh, this is the Black History Month, what did we learn as the Black as the Black Mental Health Fraternity from from celebrating mental I uh, mean uh, Black History Month? What is what are those lessons that we are learning from all these things? If I may, uh, let me start with it, Dr. Love. Um, and one of the lessons personally I learned is that um, to the original, the originality matters. Okay, that is that is a striking thing. Okay, I, I, this thing shouldn't be imposed on me. I am my own person. I am different. I am unique. I'm beautiful. I'm black. The original. That is the striking thing I learned there. Uh, besides being original, uh, in regards to mental health. What, what are some of those lessons we learn in regards to mental health? Okay, in regards to mental health, there's nothing to be ashamed of if you have a mental health issue. You know, that's one thing with uh, Africa. You were not here when we discussed it. We discussed it extensively. Uh, like uh, Sal said, it's actually associated with stigma. If an African mm-hmm. should come and tell you, I'm having this, I'm having postpartum depression, I'm having depression, I'm having anxiety, they'll look at you. Uh, they are supposed to be strong. So most of these things are under underreported in Africa. So there's nothing to be ashamed of if you have a mental health issue. Come forward. That's what it's I totally, uh, I totally, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I totally agree with what um, Sister Love said. And actually, it's how important it is that we always remember that we are. Um, we are connected and that the spirit of Ubuntu is really very um, important, you know, and that through this we can um, utilize our own indigenous African ways, you know, in a way that will advance us as a people. So as we have all been um, miseducated, socialized, and we try to regain and acquire our own ways of being and ways of doing, you know, that this is a very important thing to us as Black people in these times of modernity. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, now looking, because today we are honoring uh, the Black psychologists that uh, maybe it's possible for us to... Can you put the mic on your mouth? <laughs> uh, today we are actually honoring Black psychologists who made it possible for us to easily actually talk about mental health issues today? Because if it were not for them, we wouldn't talk about mental health issues today. 
there. Right. So what are some of those lessons that these people have had to teach us so that we are able to actually feel free to discuss mental health the way we are discussing it right now? Hmm. Dr. Lang, let's start with you. Actually, we've discussed that also, right? Mommy Tony. Yes, we, yes. We discussed extensively when you were off. <laughs> we even mentioned some of the pioneers. We mentioned how their work uh, personally affected us individually mm -hmm. and collectively. Yes. Um, and then uh, Mommy Tony had to read a biography of some of them and were able to input to mm. I mean, I could yeah. read something about Dan uh, Press Wilson to honor one of our female pioneer. He was Francis Craig Wilson, was born in March 18, 1935, um, transitioned January 2nd, 2016. And um, she's an American Afrocentrist psychiatrist who was born into a family that had already produced two doctors. After receiving her bachelor's degree, she went on and pursued a career in general and child psychi psychiatry. So maybe another tip for reading is her essay, The Crest Theory of Color Confrontation and Racism, White Supremacy. So this theory is, um, is rooted in the origins of racism and the effects that it has based on the different um, degrees of um, skin color, of melanin, depending on the amount of melanin we have in our skin, the, that um, there are different racial perceptions and developments. She also talks about the quality of whiteness that as a genetic inadequacy, yeah, or a relative deficiency or disease based upon the inability to to produce melanin. Um, her work is very um, groundbreaking. She has also the ISIS papers, the keys to the colors, and um, we honor this great warrior team, team Francis Kresnelke. She also, there also, there's also a lot on YouTube, which um, you can also look at. This was her name again. Francis Cress Wilson. Okay. She believed that the key to eradicating racism lies in self-respect, discipline, and education. And she says, we must clean up our neighborhoods. We must revolutionize ourselves. Whether white people are consciously or subconsciously aware of it, they are behaving in a manner to ensure white genetic survival. And we must know this truth. And the truth is the first step toward real strength. Go on, please. Yes. So this is also... Um, important i think i think what today has shown us again is how important it is how important this month is actually it should be 365 days in a year right that um, we are learning our story black history you know and it's um sad to see somebody told me they went to um a university I think it was the University of, um, of Lagos. And they were expecting, this was a German student who was here and went there and was expecting to find all this literature about, you know, black historians, black doctors, and there was, no, there was nothing there. So I hope it's the right university, he said. I can't, you know, but. Um, yeah, and I, I hope so next time a more, of, more of this discussion will take place and we'll be able to act them. We'll be yeah. able to you know, do things from our own corner. Okay. So on this uh, note, I would like to give a middle somewhere else. 
Thank you, so Thank much. you, Mommy Toy. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Nukoma. <laughs> Good morning, You're ladies. welcome. <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> How is everybody? Uh, Dr. Megan, you're so late, but uh, you're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> yes, welcome. I apologize. When I agreed, I did not look at my calendar, and so I had a doctor appointment. So, so we got your apology. So you have no issues coming in at this time. Yes. So you, yeah, before not concluding, concluding uh, our discussion, but you can give us a few insights of what you think about uh, Black History Month in regards to Black mental health matters. How does Black History Month impact on Black mental health matters? Um, well, definitely, you know, we definitely need to know the history of, uh, uh -oh. go ahead, please. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely knowing our history and how, um, things were like, I think the importance of history is knowing what has happened before so you can be preventative about it. I think that's part of the problem with the whole CRT and all this other stuff, they don't want that known because I just feel like, okay, it'll keep keep us aware of not allowing those certain things to happen again. Um, the good thing is, you know, there are allies in our community and so they can help prevent it as well. But our and our mental health is different from others' mental health. Nobody has experienced what we have experienced as um, Black Americans, even though there were situations where people were enslaved, it was a different, you know, experience versus like this and then it wasn't added on to by Jim Crow and continued redlining that we have right now, voter suppression, all the things that they are trying to do, you know, at this point. And I mean, if you look back in history, this is how it all started. It started quote unquote little and got bigger. And the next thing you know, you know, there's separate bathrooms. <laughs> so you're muted. I can't hear you, Claire. You're muted. Now today we are celebrating a black psych. We're actually honoring black psychologists mm -hmm. who have uh, contributed diversely in uh, black black uh, mental health. So, yes. uh, is there a, a black psychologist whom you know who have done who has done something for the black mental health fraternity, so that maybe you can give us some insight about those people and we can get to know about them and their contributions. Um. I'm sorry, I went from one thing to another, but um, I can't think of the person's name right now, but I do a lot of um, presentations about microaggressions. And um, while there is a, another doctor that has been given credit for that, that was actually started and um, researched first by a black man in the 70s. Um, I don't have my presentation with me, uh, but he he's the one who discovered and coined the term microaggressions, which I kind of now, usually when I do my presentations, I call it more, like covert racism because that's what it is. It's just a different way, you know, to be racist and, you know, but it's a softer way of saying it. And some of it is intentional. And so people can be educated, but the question is, do they want to be educated? So, yeah. What are some of the lessons do we draw from the psychologists that we're honoring today so that we can maybe uh, implement the lessons in our daily work so that, so that we can improve the mental health uh, work mm -hmm. that we are doing? Uh, well, he discusses um, not only recognizing uh, microaggressions, but how to combat them. Um, and so just to give an overview, just in case some of our guests don't know, uh, microaggressions are like small slights that are given to um, people of color, but also um, other minority groups. So um, sexual minorities and all of that. And so it could be as simple as me um, being a business owner and owning my own practice. Um, but when somebody comes in for an appointment who has never seen me, they're asking for the real boss or, you know, like they, they assume that I'm the secretary or whatever. Or when um, students are at schools and they see um, a student of color in a doctoral program, but they just assume that they are like the janitor or something like that. So that's what microaggressions are. Um, and so one of the ways that he says to combat that is to call it out. 
And that includes the person, the group of people who are being um, having those microaggressions against them, but then also allies who you shouldn't, you know, they, he says they shouldn't be sitting around just watching things happen. They should say something to their peers. So, if, for instance, if you have a um, a Caucasian person that says something, a Caucasian person, another Caucasian person that is, has some awareness will say to them like, hey, that's not appropriate to say or that's a, you know, that's a that joke is racist or, you know, that comment is racist, all of the above. Okay, um, thank you very much, Dr. Megan. Since we found us concluding, uh, thank you for the brief remarks that you've given us. And whoever has been uh, watching us on our different uh, social media platforms, thank you very much. I see people watching from the UK, from Liberia, from South Africa. Uh, if people, we don't take it for granted, we thank you very much for keeping it up with us. And uh, thank you very much whoever has uh, celebrated Black History Month at uh, Black Matters Matters today. So uh, from me, the host clan, Asasura, I'm right here in Uganda, and uh, my co-host is in Germany. Dr. Megan, where are you right now? I am in the Dallas area of Texas. Uh -huh. Dr. Megan is in Texas. So as you can see, we are we are a global community at Black Mental Health Matters, and um, would like to wish you a good night from in, uh, from here in Uganda. For us, we're going to sleep. It's already late at night. And uh, I think in Texas, it's morning time right now. It is noon, 12.30. Uh -huh. And in German, I also think sister is almost getting to bed. Yeah, <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting late. Yeah, yeah so uh, we wish you all the best uh, from Black Mental Health Matters. We'd like to say thank you very much for supporting and uh, have a nice time until next time.